Yes, they, they should be through the soup by now. Our maid is a Newfoundlander. She becomes very annoyed if we miss more than one course, and so she should. After you, Murray. Six thirty. He paid for his dinner and walked out of the station restaurant through the waiting room and into the street. It was growing dark, and the street lights flickered on. He began walking to the junction of Barrington Street and Spring Garden Road to catch his tram. He felt strangely peaceful. He felt he was home. At the corner, he stood and watched the splintered clouds in the west shake loose one by one from the turmoil of the sunset and begin their drift to sea. The sun had rolled on beyond Nova Scotia into the west. It was setting over Montreal now and sending the shadow of the mountain deep into the valleys of Sherbrooke Street and Peel. It was turning the frozen St. Lawrence crimson and lining it with the blue shadows of the trees and buildings along its banks. The prairies now were endless plains of glittering bluish snow. In the Rockies, the peaks were gleaming obelisks in the mid-afternoon. The railway line, that tenuous thread which bound Canada to both the great oceans and made her a nation with one end here in the descending darkness of Nova Scotia and the other in the flush of a British Columbian noon. This was his country. Seven o'clock. Barometer Rising. A story of Nova Scotia in the First World War. Barometer Rising, the novel by Hugh McLennan, adapted for broadcasting by Rita Greer. Production is by Rupert Kaplan of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and it is presented by the CBC International Service. Part 4, Thursday. The place is Halifax. The year is 1917. The day, Thursday, December the 6th. Dawn. The whole landscape shone. The rays of light poured in from the seaward horizon as the sun rose, first red, then orange, then shining gold like the heart of a fire. The light poured into Halifax Harbor and lit up the mist which lay like a liquid over the flat water and spread into the lower streets of the town. Sparks of light leapt off the weather vane of St. Mary's Cathedral, and the rising shield of Citadel Hill was bathed in a golden sheen. Nothing seemed to move, except the sun. And a small black ship crawling slowly into harbor through the open submarine net. In the houses of the town, Halifax men and women stirred in their beds and awoke to a new day. The black ship glided up the stream to the harbor with hardly a sound. She moved low in the water, heavy with cargo, but only her crew and the Admiralty and the Commodore of the convoy knew what her cargo was. Men on the motionless ships in the stream watched her pass and showed no interest. None had been told they were giving sea room to a floating bomb. The captain of a British cruiser came on deck to watch the black ship pass and saw her name, Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc, and I wonder what she's got in there. He looked at the oily canisters piled on her foredeck. Benzol, probably. Well, a very sloppy ship. The Mont Blanc proceeded cautiously up the stream. In the south end of Halifax, Mariah Wayne woke suddenly at the sound of trotting horses. (sighs) Soldiers. At this hour of the morning. Oh, dear, they shouldn't be allowed to go through the streets and disturb people. I'm going to tell Geoffrey he shouldn't let them take horses through the streets in the morning. I'll go over there right after breakfast. Alfred, are you listening? The Mont Blanc was moving toward the upper harbour now. With little sound or evidence of motion except for a ripple at the bow and a thin wake. Bells sounded in her engine room as she pulled out gently to the exact centre of the channel and moved toward the narrows. 8.30. Miss Penny, is that you? 
Yes, Sadie. Can I have breakfast right away? I'm late. Oh, Miss Penny, indeed you are. I've got your grapefruit ready right here. You sit down to table. Fine, I'll have to hurry. Roddy. What? What are you doing here still? Uh, I'm reading the newspaper. It's all right, Penny. Father's not here. You'd better go off to school. Here you are. I brought you some tea and toast as well. Oh, thank you, Sadie. Did you hear Colonel Wayne stirring? He uh, telephoned last night to say he'd be working. All night? Yes. Oh, well, I'll clean up then. Why do you work all night, Penny? Is it about the war? Oh, I suppose so. Tell me, Penny. I won't let on to a soul. Roddy, school. I can keep a secret. Did you know there was a German submarine just outside the harbor? <laughs> Don't tell me you saw it from the Citadel. Willie Moffat told me. His uncle was on the duty boat and he saw it. It's a secret, though. You know perfectly well the duty boat never leaves the harbor and couldn't possibly see a submarine. Now stop telling me lies and go to school. All right. The Mont Blanc was moving slowly up the narrows, now almost hidden behind the rise of Richmond Bluff. Suddenly, around the projection of this hill, another vessel came, heading for the open sea. She flew the Norwegian flag, and to the startled pilot of the munitioner, the name Imo was plainly visible on the bow. She was moving at half speed as she made the sharp turn out of the basin into the narrows. And at half speed, with white water surging away from her forefoot, she swept across the path of the Mont Blanc, exposing a gaunt flank labelled in giant letters, Belgian Relief. Then she straightened and pointed her bow directly at the forequarter of the Mont Blanc. 838. In the narrows of Halifax Harbour, the two ships moved toward a single point. Staccato orders broke from the bridge of the Mont Blanc. Bells jangled and megaphone shouts came from both bridges. The ships sheared in the same direction, then sheared back again. Then, with a violent shock, the bow of the Imo struck the plates of the Mont Blanc and ground a third of the way through the deck and forward hold. A shower of sparks splashed out from the screaming metal. For a fraction of a second, there was intense silence. Then smoke appeared out of the shattered deck of the munition ship, followed by a racing film of flame. The film of flame raced and whitened and became deeper like an opaque liquid. The men on the bridge looked at each other. Sailors poured out through the hatches onto the deck. An officer ran forward with a hose. But before he could connect it, his men were ready to abandon ship. The flames swept over the canisters of benzol and became a roaring tide of heat which trembled and leapt in a body at the bridge. The captain and the pilot ran, and then they stood helplessly with the greasy folds of black smoke surrounding them and the metal of the deck beginning to glow under their feet. They glanced downward. Underneath that metal lay leashed an immeasurable energy. A half million pounds of TNT and 2,300 tons of picric acid lay there in the darkness, while the fire above and below the deck turned the hollow shell of the vessel into a bake oven. The entire crew was in the lifeboat now. The officers followed, and frantically they rowed toward the wooded slope opposite Halifax, where they broke and ran for the shelter of the woods. By nine o'clock, everyone along the entire waterfront was aware that a ship was on fire in the harbor. The jetties and docks and shipyards near the narrows were crowded with people watching. The Mont Blanc had become the center of a tableau. Even from the wharf side, you felt the intense expectancy in the firemen playing the hoses, the rhythmic reverberation in the beat of the flames, the steady steam of the scalding water on the decks. Everything else for miles around seemed motionless and silent. Then a needle of flaming gas, thin as a mast, and of a brilliance unbelievably intense, shot through the deck of the Mont Blanc near the funnel and flashed more than 200 feet toward the sky. The firemen were thrown back and their hoses jumped out of control and slashed through the air. Then, all movement and life about the ship were encompassed in a sound beyond hearing as the Mont Blanc opened up. The train swung through a long arc as it swerved around the foot of Richmond Bluff. They were going out of Halifax now. They were leaving the hideous wreckage of the town. It was going to be a bad winter, Neil thought, with hospitals jammed and schools working double shifts and the thousands of people living in makeshift. Down the coach from where he stood inside the corner by the drinking water tank, the black leather seats of the colonist car were down, 
and the wounded lay on either side of the aisle, swaying as the train swayed. That was part five of Barometer Rising, a novel by Hugh McLennan, adapted for broadcasting by Rita Greer, and produced by Rupert Kaplan of the CBC. This is part of the drama series presented by the CBC International Service. Thank you.